Thank you very much. My old friend, Bill Burns, and he is, uh, as I look out at some of the more prominent members of uh, previous administrations, and by the way, an awful lot of credit. The credit goes to some of the people in this room in the Bush administration who, uh, who carried this, uh, this agreement uh, over the threshold. But uh, in all the time that I've worked, and I hate to admit this now, uh, almost uh, 42 years of being a United States Senator uh, for 36 years and uh, uh, six years as Vice President, uh, um, I've had a chance to work with some really, really talented people. But I've never met anyone, and I think you probably all agree, and there's a lot of talented people in this room, including another Burns I'm looking at, uh, is that I've never seen the combination uh, as starkly demonstrable of scholarship, judgment, wisdom, and just plain, simple decency, as I've seen uh, with uh, my friend, Ambassador Bill Burns. He, um, uh, and by the way, uh, the last piece goes a long way, decency, in terms of gaining the trust of, uh, of his counterparts uh, throughout the world. And during our administration, on uh, every really difficult problem, um, uh, Bill was pulled in uh, to uh, this sort of, uh, well, he was number two man at the State Department. In every crisis, Bill was pulled in. And uh, so, Bill, thank you. And by the way, Bill, I did solve the problem. There are five Bidens in India. <laughs> uh, in Mumbai. My, it uh, turns out, my, uh, as Paneet Talwar, my great friend, and was with me for years in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, when I was chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee before that, um, I, uh, I did say uh, that uh, I was asked whether I had any relatives in India, and I said, well, I got this letter when I was uh, a senator, uh, right after I got elected, because of some personal difficulties in my family at the time. I remember getting it, and then there was an event in my family that uh, uh, diverted my attention before I got sworn in. And, um, but a gentleman saying, uh, we're directly related. Uh, my name is Biden, and I live in Mumbai, et cetera. Turns out there was a captain um, uh, who was my great, great, great grandfather named George Biden, who was a captain in the East Indian Trading Company. And uh, when he retired, he settled and married an Indian woman and settled in Mumbai. And so uh, I, I wasn't positive, I never followed up on it until a reporter the next day when I was speaking to the stock exchange said to me, by the way, I checked, you have five Bidens living in Mumbai. Um, and so I haven't come back and called them. I haven't, uh, although she did give me the number. <laughs> I'm a little, I'm going to check it out first, uh, Congressman, before I call. I don't want to get them into any trouble. But anyway, Mr. Banerjee, thank you uh, for helping us commemorate the important milestone uh, of, uh, and for being a part of this historic effort. You know, I also want to thank Ambassador Singh for joining us, and I want to uh, recognize three of the many great Indian Americans here tonight. Um, uh, there's Congressman uh, Barra is here tonight, and there, there you are, Congressman. It's good to see you. And, uh, um, and uh, uh, Assistant Secretary Biswal is here as well, uh, as well as, uh, I already mentioned him, uh, uh, um, the Assistant Secretary Puneet Talwar, who is a great and close, close personal friend. And finally, I want to extend my appreciation to Rick the Carnegie Endowment for organizing this event and for your efforts to open a new center next year in Delhi to continue to work, to continue to work in the region. Ten years ago, I had the honor, uh, because of my position as chairman of the committee, of leading the United States Senate uh, in an effort to uh, ratify the U.S.-India Civil Nuclear Agreement. And uh, it helped, in my view, uh, remove the single largest irritant between the two world's greatest democracy. And it provided a way forward for low carbon technologies and clean energy production in India. But frankly, it was more than an agreement on nuclear power and energy. 
For my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, it was not a vote on civil nuclear cooperation. It was a vote for India. And that's how it was viewed at the time. It was a vote for India. And the execution of this vision required tremendous courage in both countries and diplomatic outreach in capitals all over the world. It required us to break with entrenched orthodoxies to achieve something that, that in retrospect, was long overdue. And the United States Senate required bipartisan cooperation in a moment of deep bipartisan divide, uniting Republican and Republican President and Democratic Congress together behind a common goal. In divided government, you can do things like this. We saw this in, recently in the TPP and uh, in, in, in the trade arena. A Republican Congress and a Democratic president. But it's painful. It was painful then, and it was painful now. And if you doubt me, I'll take off my shirt and show you the scars on my back. Um, but it was extremely worthwhile. And India required Prime Minister Singh to gamble, and he would literally, it's easy to say it now, but at the time, he gambled the future of his government on a vision for the future of his nation. I've always felt that the most important thing a public official uh, needs to know is on what principle is it worth losing over? I mean that sincerely. What is worth losing over? If you don't know that and you're entering public life, you should go on to another endeavor. You'll make a lot more money, you'll be less happy, and you will not be conflicted. <laughs> but if you know what's worth losing over, as the President did, as Many who, uh, and President Singh, uh, uh, Prime Minister Singh, understood what was worth losing over. And it's met the test. Together, we set aside 40 years of estrangement to lay a foundation for a strategic relationship. And today, the United States and India, the relationship is truly, in the words of President Obama, one of the defining partnerships in the 21st century. And it will be. And if we do our job, it can even be more important every year as we move forward. Annual two-way trade is now more than $100 billion, five times the level it was 10 years ago. And there's no reason why it can't be five times that 10 years from now. Americans made more than one million trips to India last year. One million. Today, over 100,000, 100,000 Indians attend college, young people, in the United States of America each year, 100,000. India now conducts more military exercises in the United States than any other country. Let me say that again. <laughs> India now conducts more military exercises with the United States of America, if you can believe that, than any other country in the world. If I had said that to you 10 years ago, you would have said, he is certifiable. <laughs> but think about it. Sometimes we forget what you did. Sometimes we forget, we take for granted, well, this is how it's always been. It took courage on the part of two leaders to take an important step. And together, we transformed the bilateral relationship into a global partnership based on shared values, interests, responsibilities. And all of these will go to shape the next century, in my view if we stay the course. Two years ago, I traveled to Mumbai, a city full of history, dreams, and incredible energy. While in Mumbai, I saw firsthand how entrepreneurship seems almost hardwired into Indian society, from rickshaw walls to web programmers. I met women studying to become engineers at the Indian Institute of Technology. I spent three hours with them, sitting, listening to their dreams about what they anticipated they were going to do. And it wasn't just, I'm going to get an engineering degree. It's, I'm going to help change the world. No different than if I was sitting in Silicon Valley talking to a bunch of students at Stanford University. They believed it. And women, women in India are finally arriving to a place that will become some technology technology. It confirmed my long-held belief that India's greatest domestic energy source is its people. I'm so relentlessly optimistic about the future of this partnership, but there are steps 
that we have to take in this partnership to realize its full potential for the sake of our two nations, but also the sake of the region and the world. A lot depends on this relationship. First, we need to build on the success we achieved 10 years ago by continuing to develop clean, a clean energy future for both our nations. Thanks to our partnership, we can look forward to the U.S. nuclear reactors that will provide enough electricity to power New Delhi and Mumbai through peak usage in the hottest summer day. When the President visited India in January, we achieved a breakthrough in understanding on nuclear liability, which is sort of the last stumbling block in this whole process. One that paves the way for our cooperation to proceed with commercial negotiations. And we mobilized nearly $3 billion in clean energy projects in India and plan to expand those efforts. And in September, when we host our first strategic and commercial dialogue, Secretary Moniz will also chair the energy dialogue to discuss renewables, energy efficiency, and the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. And these dialogues are going to help our nations work together to chart a path to a successful outcome for the Paris Climate Talks. Secretary, I'm more optimistic about the Paris Talks now than I was by a long shot even six months ago. I am, fact, I am optimistic. Climate change threatens the productivity and the livelihoods of millions of Indian farms and the availability of water. It also increases the risk of, to tens of millions of people in India that face natural disaster and rising sea levels. Of course, India's first priority, as Prime Minister Modi has made clear, is lifting citizens out of poverty. But as the Prime Minister has also said, environmental conservation can and must go hand in hand with development. It's not possible, if you are rational about it, to think of one without the other, particularly in India, with the low-lying areas that contain tens of millions of people. I commend, the Prime, I, I commend Prime Minister Modi for the courageous speech in which he challenged the people of India to return to their natural, cultural history of caring for the environment. He said, and I quote, in a country where natural is above, nature is above all, where that's been the ideal, we have no right to exploit nature. We can harness natural resources, but more than that, we do not get the right to use or misuse them. End of quote. I believe he was right when he wrote the letter to the United Nations, uh, to the UN heads of state declaring, quote, Combating climate change is our collective obligation as a planet. I believe he believes it. I believe he's committed to it. America is working to lower carbon pollution that causes climate change. Now, I know there's some people up in the hill that don't think there's gravity, and they don't think there's climate change. I get that. I understand. I'm a Catholic. You know, I, I, remember, I remember what Galileo, you know, what happened to Galileo. But we got it right, eventually. You know what I mean? I shouldn't be that was a joke, folks. <laughs> but all kidding aside, I mean, even if you suggest not all climate change is due uh, um, uh, to man-made um, actions, but how you can deny it just is, it, it's, we're going to look back in this period and wonder how we could have thought that, some could have thought that. America is working, notwithstanding the overwhelming opposition we're getting, to lower carbon pollution that causes climate change, and we've brought it down to its lowest level in two decades. We have much more to do, and we plan to do much more. Will it be a fight? Yes. But we believe the American people are where we are, where most of you are, where Prime Minister Modi is. India has also taken steps to provide incentives for reforestation, setting a target of 175 gigawatts of solar and wind energy by 2022. We hope to see these ambitious goals uh, embodied in the post-2020 climate plans the Indian government will submit to the UN in the coming months. And we need to work together to achieve a Paris Agreement that, that drives ambitious action from all the major economies as we ratchet down global emissions over time, but in the near term. That would be a legacy 
a leadership both our countries could be very, very proud of for our children, our grandchildren, and our great-grandchildren. And it will be a powerful, a powerful continuation of the partnership that began 10 years ago in a partnership that has reached a new level under President Obama's leadership. And he expect me to say that. He's my friend and he's the President of the United States and I work with him. But he has genuinely led. And we're committed to taking this relationship further for each of our own well-being, the United States and India, for the benefit of the international community. And by the way, you all travel the world. The rest of the world gets it. They get it. They get it. That our relationship, if we get it right, has a dispositive, positive impact on them. Not every neighbor thinks that. But most of the world understands it, for real. To seize the opportunities of a changing world, the administration has pursued a strategy of rebalancing to the Asia-Pacific region. As part of that strategy, we have strengthened and modernized our alliances and our partnerships throughout the region. And our deepening friendship with India is an indispensable part of that rebalanced strategy. At the same time, and for similar reasons, India, of its own volition, is rebalancing as well. India has looked east through travel and trade for millennia. And these ties are re-emerging. India is working more closely with regional institutions such as the ASEAN, convergence of, the, of the India's Act East and U.S. rebalance in Asia is good news for the region and really good news for the partnership. It was one of the issues I discussed at length in my last visit to India. Our joint strategic vision for the Asia Pacific and Indian Ocean region issued by the President and the Prime Minister in January serves as a beacon for uh, and every day we're, we're, we're working to try to make this vision a reality. It's not easy, but it's real. It's possible. To that end, we're deepening cooperation across the board from maritime domain awareness to regional connectivity to humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. We're also looking to schedule a ministerial level trilateral with Japan this fall to strengthen the East Asia Summit on its 10th anniversary. And we'll continue to seek ways to work together on issues uh, of defense and maritime security. As I've told leaders throughout Asia, and I've spent a fair amount of time there the last six years, including visiting delegations from China and Vietnam just in the past month, the United States has been, is now, and will continue to remain a Pacific power, period. The Pacific Ocean breaks over 7,623 miles of our shoreline. What happens in Asia and the Pacific affects the United States of America more than anything that happens in the world, I suspect. Both the United States and India have a strong interest in maintaining freedom of navigation from the South China Sea to the Indian Ocean. And every nation, including both India and China, has benefit from the, benefited from the stability and prosperity the United States has helped maintain for nearly 70 years. I've had this direct conversation with President Xi when he asked me, why, why do we call ourselves a Pacific power? I said, because we are. And it's benefited you greatly, greatly. And he acknowledged it. We'll continue to play a role as a Pacific power for decades to come. But we also believe it's a role of stability. And we welcome the security partnerships that has flourished in India over the past decade. When a small naval exercise, naval exercise called Malabar was first envisioned at a conference center 25 years ago in, uh, in Virginia, Few could have imagined that one day it would include Japan or that we'd be working together with India on aircraft carrier technology. This fall, a high-level Indian naval delegation will visit Newport News for briefings and a tour of the USS Gerald Ford, our newest aircraft carrier. Our emerging carrier cooperation epitomizes the strength of our security partnership and it's a signal both of how far we've come and the potential for the future. 
two decades after uh, Secretary Cohen signed the agreed minute on defense relations, uh, U.S. military aircraft, aircraft, not carriers, aircraft, have become the mainstay of India's military. We saw India's airlift, airlift capabilities earlier this year in the deserts of Yemen and in the mountains of Nepal, where India evacuated thousands after the earthquake and helped us find the remains of our fallen Marines who perished in a helicopter accident. India has also committed billions and lead the international and led the international response to the earthquake. That's just one of the ways in which is reaching out to its neighbors. India has peacefully resolved border questions with the neighbor Bangladesh, concluding historic land boundary agreement that settled the status of thousands of citizens. Prime Minister Modi became the first Indian Prime Minister in more than two decades to visit Sri Lanka improving ties with this island neighbor barely 30 miles off India's coast. And last week, a meeting between Prime Minister Modi and Pakistan's Prime Minister Sharif marked an important step forward in lowering tensions and leading to constructive dialogue. Our hope and prayer is it will yield more. We strongly encourage both sides to build in this strategic opening, to embrace trade, and economic linkages and build constituents for peace, constituencies for peace in both countries. We're also grateful for India's generosity in the support of Afghans, Afghanistan's economic and political stability, given our shared interest in a peaceful, stable, and prosperous Afghanistan that no longer serves as a safe haven for terrorism. We also know that uh, a powerful, growing, vibrant Indian economy is in the United States' self-interest. And a growing U.S. economy is in the best interest of India as well. This is not a zero-sum game. Our mutual economic renewal is the ballast for our relationship. And we each have a stake in the other's economic vitality. The United States supports the goal of creating jobs and bolstering production here at home as well as in India. But we need policies that can help achieve these goals without distorting trade or discouraging innovation. A way to go on that yet. Concluding a high standard bilateral investment treaty would be a very strong step forward, helping to make India a magnet for U.S. capital and technology and benefiting Indians investing across the United States. We're also working with India to achieve a successful conclusion of the WTO Doha Round and in implementing the World Trade Facilitation Agreement agreed to at the WTO Ministerial in Valley in 2013. When the Trade Facilitation Agreement enters into force, it will provide significant benefits for both our economies and the global trading system as a whole. And as Prime Minister Modi knows, India can move forward by cutting red tape battling corruption, and lifting limits on foreign direct investment. But that's a decision for India. As I told Mr. <coughs> Modi when he's here, I never tell another man or woman what's in their interest. I can tell them what we think is in our interest and hope they find it in theirs. But I'm absolutely convinced it's in India's interest as well. Knowledge-driven economies like India and the United States depend on our ability to share ideas. But they need not tell the chamber. Companies must be confident that their intellectual property rights are going to be protected. You know, we're at a moment when uh, our cyber cooperation is poised to reach new heights, opening new avenues of cooperation on virtual threats, whether glitches or, or malicious attacks. They carry real-world consequences and can wreak, wreak, wreak havoc on both our economies. We're working to build a greater cybersecurity to combat terrorist use of the Internet, to lead global efforts to develop technologies and policy tools to confront the challenges of in the coming decades. We welcome India's recent announcement of support for the multi-stakeholder multi -stakeholder Internet governance. A lot of work to do yet. And we look forward to further collaboration with India to bolster the global interoperable internet 
that uh, will enable international trade and commerce and strengthen international security and foster free expression and innovation. India has over 600 million people, I need not tell this audience, under the age of 25. 600 million. With unlimited capabilities. But in some cases, with limited opportunities. A young Indian woman graduated from IIT, Bombay, who, who wants to start the next uh, Tata Motors, uh, or the next global IT giant, should be able to buy the best technology and parts wherever in the world they come from. As their competitors around the world are able to do right now. An Indian medical student with a brilliant idea for life-saving medical device should know that his or her intellectual property will be protected and rewarded because that gives him or her the financial incentive and the intellectual motivation to continue to move forward. And it fosters innovative growth. What I don't understand, and I've been going around the world dealing with economic conferences and every part of the world, what I don't get is our country's short term, not protecting intellectual property, makes some advances. But it does not develop a culture of innovation. It stifles the opportunity. And if any country has the opportunity for, innovate, for innovative breakthroughs, it's India. Just like the basic rules of physics, there are certain basic rules that comprise the path to prosperity in the 21st century of every country. We're not making them up. Don't like some of my Chinese friends suggest that we want to do it our way. There's certain basic fundamental rules that have evolved. As I said, like basic rules of physics. It takes a fair and consistent legal system that respects contracts, protects intellectual property, that roots out the cancer of corruption. There's a court system that you can actually rely on to make an objective judgment. It takes a political system that protects basic liberties, including the freedom of speech and the freedom of religion. I have said in a number of countries I've visited, paraphrasing uh, the man who's become an icon, who concluded and made clear to me that the best way to succeed is drop out of Stanford. Um, but uh, remember when he was asked the question by a student, how can, he be more, how can I be more like you, sir? He said, think different. You cannot think different. Where you cannot breathe free. You cannot think different where you are unable to challenge basic orthodoxy. You cannot think different unless you can speak your mind. It takes a society that draws on the talents of all the people, protecting the rights and voices of women, minorities, journalists, civil society, religious leaders. The world's oldest and largest democracies, India and the United States, share a view about the kind of Pacific century we seek and the values which ought, what ought to animate the regional as well as global order. We know that. Uh, in the United States and India, we lead as much by the power of our example as the example of our power. Let me say it again. The United States, I can speak for. We lead as much by the power of our example as by the example of our power. That's why so many hundreds of millions of people want to find their way to these shores. It's not because we have a military that spends more than 10, more than the next 10 militaries in the world. It's because of the power of our example. And that means our nations have a responsibility to stand united to defend the values we know our people share. We both recognize the critical importance of defending human rights, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because it's absolute, an absolute economic necessity. 
Because as surely as people cannot live without blood coursing through their veins, a society cannot survive without the full participation of the potential of all its people. As we, for, as we move forward, we should build on the important steps we've already taken to promote shared values, such as working together in the UN to support development and governance. They're not at odds. Governance efforts in countries like Afghanistan and Burma. We also have to redouble our efforts to ensure that the rights of women, members of ethnic and religious minorities, and those in the LGBT community are protected at home as well as abroad. Both our nations have struggled with these issues in our histories. But we have to remain vigilant in our efforts to make our democracy safe for all citizens and to lead the world by example. This is not some lib lab speech about, you know, it's good and decent and we're moral and honorable. It's also long-term and economic necessity. Prime Minister Modi gets it. And we should continue to work together to champion women's rights and human rights both at home and around and around the world. During our visit to India, my wife Jill and I had the opportunity to witness firsthand the transformative power of literacy and basic education to unlock the potential of girls in an Indian village. It was a bit, as we Catholic said, a bit of an epiphany to see. It was really, it was really uplifting. We need to continue to build on that potential. Because in the world's the old saying, women hold up half the world. That's not just some male trying to, you know, be sensitive. <laughs> and I have a little family where all the women are smarter than all the men. And that's not an exaggeration, and they're more accomplished. But all kidding aside, women hold up half the world. Why would you squander? half of the potential that you have. Not you, India. Why would anyone do that? As chief guest for India's Republic Day, President Obama declared that the United States and India are not just natural partners, but that America can be India's best partner. That's our goal. I agree. And the history and the journey of both our nations, I think, proves that. But it's going to require continued hard work, and progress may not come as fast as we like. And we have our own indigenous interest groups and prejudices to overcome in both countries. We're in the cusp of another, seat, in my view, we're in the cusp of another sea change decade. Bill Burns has often heard me quote uh, um, William Butler Yeats. Everybody thinks I always quote Irish poets because I'm Irish. That's not the reason I quote them, because they're the best poets. No offense to you. <laughs> That's why I quote them. <laughs> and the Irish had a similar problem with the Brits that the Indians had. Only well, ours will last longer than yours. And uh, Yeats, writing about the first rising, as we Irish say, in the 20th century, wrote a poem called Easter Sunday, 1960. And there's a line in that poem that I think better describes the circumstance of the world today than it did his Ireland at the time he wrote the poem. He said, all's changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty has been born. All's changed, changed utterly in the last 15 years. That is not hyperbole. That is not hyperbole. We're in an inflection point in human history. And I think the next decade is the cusp of another sea change that's going to take place. We're really going to get it right. And at least, I had a physics professor who said, an inflection point is you're driving down the highway 60 miles an hour with both hands on the wheel, and you turn it abruptly 10 degrees in one direction. You can never get back on the path you're on. That's happening. Not because of Barack Obama and Joe Biden or Prime Minister Modi. The change is taking place is one of those historic moments in the world. It's a sea change. And we should at least keep our hands on the wheel. We have a chance to bend history, 
just a little bit. I always say to people, if you're ever going to be involved in public life, now's the time. Everybody bemoans how difficult it is, and it is. But how many times is there a prospect to be able to actually change the trajectory of history? Just a little bit. Just a little bit. It's only occurred, in my view, five times in entire American history, and you could argue only three. It's one of those moments which our common interests are going to continue to converge, and our cooperation has the potential to reach new heights if we take on the responsibility for transforming ourselves, the region, and the world will follow. As of the civil nuclear deal, we continue to push to transform the improbable into the inevitable. We probably won't make it completely. But we sure help can make it better. And I can't think of a group of Americans or Indian American citizens or Indians who have more combined capacity and understanding the relationship in this group I'm talking to right now. So to steal a phrase from another program I started about violence against women on sexual sexual violence on campuses, it's on us. It's on us in this room to step up. I want to thank you all. I hope you don't think I'm just a cockeyed optimist. I've been doing this longer than most of you. I know the history and the journey of this nation. And we had a chance, a transformative opportunity. I want to thank you all for all that you do. May God bless the United States and India, and may God protect our troops. Thank you very much. Thank you.